Ooh, hello, and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Kruptos, who is a retired reverend, Canadian, and, well, not a retired Canadian, he's just Canadian, and he's also a writer and a poster on the internet that I enjoy. I really enjoy his book reviews and his thought pieces that walk around the topics of propaganda and what's kind of called dissident right thought or you know, Machiavellian power politics kind of critique, like critique of systems of power. And in this conversation, we talk a lot about theology, we talk a lot about Christianity and its moral content and how that intersects with a political Christianity and its power content. Uh, you can find Kruptos online via the links below. He's got a great sub stack and a lot of his essays are performed as audio, which is what I really appreciate when I'm driving around town, out on the streets, looking for trouble or just trying to go from point A to point B. And I have my favorite little writers playing in the background, like maybe you have me right now. So without further ado, here is Kruptos. So you've been well? Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, pretty eventful. When, when did we speak last? It was probably February, I think, or something like that of last year. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it was, it's been a while, like yeah. almost a year now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. just as I was, actually just before I um, took, took some time off of Twitter and relaunched it again, I think I've been back on for about nine months since then. But yeah. 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 So, yeah you've, now you've moved, I think. Yeah, I, I moved, your setting is I got married, what? I'm a, I'm a stepdad, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things have changed. Life moves fast, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's been a pretty busy year, yeah. I can imagine. And you're still recording, so there you go. Yeah, every every couple of days, got to keep the content flowing, you know? Well, that's exactly it, right? That's That's probably the biggest struggle I find with writing is it just constantly finding the time to actually produce something. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoy that you're doing both audio and, uh, I guess, written content. That's great. That was a suggestion made to me by one of my subscribers because some of the pieces, especially the book-related ones, have gotten a little long. Mm -hmm. And so he said, he says, hey, he's, he says, I don't have time to read that whole piece. Like, I just can't find the time. To, it's like 45 minutes. But he says, I do have an hour long commute. Yeah. And he says, if you read it, he says, or if you, if you, you know, give a spoken word. And then I thought, well, that's kind of what Charles Haywood does with his book reviews. And I yeah. thought, well, I'll give that a whirl. Yeah. And so I started trying that and um, it's worked out pretty well. No, it was uh, um, going through your Schmidt work. Oh, the the latest one, yeah. Uh, uh, well, the latest. It's yeah, an older piece that I just. Yeah. Yeah, it's from twenty twenty two. Yeah. Um, but I um just recently recorded. So there's a gap from when I started recording the new stuff to like the old stuff. I've just been kind of going back and recording. I think I've got like fourteen episodes or fourteen pieces to record yet, and then I'll be all caught up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're gifted with a, a great voice, so it well, thank you. Works in your favor to do that yeah they've they said to me that i have a preacher's voice so it carries well and the tone is about that sort of mid baritone yeah yeah it's not low enough to be bass and it's not high enough to be tenor so i'm like kind of right in the middle there yeah, so yeah, it doesn't yeah, work yeah. well for singing but for public speaking it's good yeah you're a mid i'm a mid oh yeah there we go that's what you want to hear right <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i so i've been thinking this morning about um the Schmidt stuff, because that's what I've been listening to. And what I was just thinking just now before we started was about, um, like, how does that, with, with the critique of liberalism, putting the individual first, and how does that compare and contrast with Christianity, which does also put the individual first over the nation, I guess, not necessarily over the family and stuff, but you have a personal relationship with God. You have a personal accountability between you and your creator. That see, these, I think are common misunderstandings in, in Christian theology. So that yes, there is a personal decision that you make, um, and this sort of everybody has this thing to side of like, you know, um, choose you this day whom you will, whom you will serve. 
but um, Christianity from the very beginning was um, very much a communal affair. And so we are a body of believers, first and foremost, the, the people of God. So within the people of God, there's various roles, but the way that we react to and, and interact with God is never a person in isolation. You're always a person in community. Hmm. Um, so we talk about personal salvation, but it's not really individualistic salvation. And it's, and it's, um, and when you read the gospels and the, the um, especially the Acts of the Apostles, you discover very quickly that, um, you know, whole households would get so, would get saved. And usually at the um, institution or, or the initiation of the head of the household. And so once the head of the household had decided that, you know, he was giving his life to Christ, the whole household was Christian. And that was just kind of the way it worked. And so... It's it's one of those those mis um, you know common misunderstandings, especially in an individualist society, that um, Christian faith is voluntaristic. And hmm. so you know now I tend to be Cal like not tend I'm a Calvinist, so um, I do have a you know an acceptance of a predestinarian type of theology. But um, I think for most people, they you know if you think of church as individualistic and voluntaristic. You don't quite understand properly the 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 no or or what the the role of the church is in the believer, and that primarily we interact with God um, as a believing community first and foremost, and not primarily first and foremost as a believing individual. Hmm. Um, so the a person of faith always should be a person in community, in a community of believers. You're never really, you're not supposed to sort of go it alone and um, do your faith on your own. That's not really a thing in Christian tradition. It's, uh, you're always a person rooted in a community. Well, hermits. Yeah, but even then you're usually under the authority of um, an elder or teacher. There's somebody thing. And the hermits are kind of, you know, for every rule, there's an exception, but the, even the hermits are generally thought to be under the, um, the discipline of their bishop or so forth. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So there, there is an authority, like a hierarchical structure. So, um, you know, the, the, yeah, it's, um, that, that I would say, so, and, and oftentimes when you had the, those monks, like even the desert monks, they were often in community in the desert. So they would spend much of their time in isolation and prayer, but they often came together for, you know, for worship and other events. It wasn't exclusively isolation. Um, and they would, they went into the desert and were together as a community, but, um, you know, um, spending mm. a lot of their time in isolation and prayer, but as a community, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the conversation is going to branch out into something more uh, concrete, I'm sure. But I'm just kind of wrapping with these ideas because I guess the, the overarching question is how does theology inform politics and or the lack mm. of theology inform politics? Just a few days ago, Richard Dawkins, a little clip of him floated oh, around, yeah. which is really fascinating, where he's saying that he he's <clears throat> culturally Christian, but at heart he's an atheist. So he's got this uh, kind of core a spirituality or non-spirituality, but he wants to be embedded in a religion. He wants to be embedded in this community that gives him the values or reflects the values that you know, the community already imprinted on him. Um, and yeah, you know, without guess, actually having to be involved in the faith. Yeah, yeah. It was um, yeah, the bit a bit disingenuous to spend much of your life trying to tear down the Christian faith, only in your later years to realize that like. Oh wait, a Christian society is better than one that is the society I was trying to create by being a strident atheist, and um, that's uh, it. Yeah, it was that was I saw that that interview and, and went through it and just was like, well, that's very very interesting that you would come to realize it. It's it's one of those things where in every healthy society, you know, I, I'm of the mind that that most healthy societies are baseline conservative in a sense that they value tradition, value the past, value the foundation they're put on. But societies also have to adapt if they're going to survive over the long term. So every society needs voices within it that are 
um, discordant, shall we say, um, and will challenge these prevailing orthodoxies when they're needed. But to have a society that in which everybody all the time is challenging society's orthodoxies is disastrous for the whole of society. Hmm. That it just um, so if you're constantly tearing down yeah. everything that was passed on to you, it basically destroys society. So you can have a handful of people who are, you know, challenge the traditions of the elders, so to speak. But to have everyone all the time challenging the traditions of the elders, basically progressivism, um, you inadvertently um, end up destroying your own society. Well, you say basically progressivism, but wouldn't it be more honest to say basically? Uh reformation basically protestantism um that that charge can be leveled against the protestants and i think that there is some validity to that um it's it's one of those things where you you know historically sort of these things happen as they happen but you know the the catholic church had reached a point where it was um corrupt and sclerotic and it was in desperate need of reform and so the, there are those that rose to reform it, and the, the Catholic Church reacted badly and tossed a number of them out, and they decided to go on their own. And as a result, um, now, you know, you end up with um, where we are at now. And so that's one of the unintended side effects of trying to reform hmm. the church is that you ended up dividing it and then dividing it again and again and again, because you... Partly you make theological correctness um, a, you know, a, a value over and above the unity of the community, right? Whereas okay. there was a lot more theological diversity within the church prior to the Reformation um, without there necessarily being heresy. But yeah. afterwards, you begin to sort of, you end up with the what you say, like the purity spiral, right? And that's yeah. kind of what happens to the churches over time is that kind of purity spiral. So yeah. it may be that external pressures are going to push in the other direction and bring Christians back together again to realize that many of the things that divided us are inconsequential um, in regard, relatively speaking, to the pressures that the church is now facing for its own future. So mm -hmm. um, the, the regime is turning its, it, the, the, the eye of Sauron is now turning itself towards the church as an enemy of progress. And so... We'll hmm. see if well, that pushes. Hasn't people the church together. claimed that the whole time, at least since the nineties, not beforehand? That this is what's been happening. That they're they're being persecuted. Christians are being persecuted. The war on Christmas, yeah, but it's you know, intensifying, like kind of very, right? So yeah. yeah, it's it's intensifying. So it's um, yeah. So that's kind of where um, now. There's various ways to describe it. There's Aaron's Aaron Wren's three phases from a positive era to a neutral era to negative era. But that doesn't quite fully capture the whole essence of it. I think that better would be to say that um, the liberalism and progressivism, having exhausted itself spiritually, is jonesing around looking for a religious foundation and sees Christianity there in some ways for the taking. And so they have been grabbing a hold of the forms and language of the faith to um, subordinate it to progressivism um, and to claim Christianity's own, the whole notion of hollowing it out and wearing it like a skin suit. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're increasingly going to see is, you know, the the pull of from towards power for people to align their Christian faith with the regime in various formats versus those who refuse to do so will become, those folks will become under increasing pressure to conform to um, the new regime Christianity. Well, um, could you describe I could go that? into length on sort of why that's happening, but yeah. I, I would like to hear that, but just like some concrete examples of how Christians would uh, end up aligning themselves with the regime. It can happen in a number of ways. So the, the more open would be, you know, the outright declarations of, um, you know, we have to accept gay marriage, we have to accept uh, transgenderism, we have to accept divorce, we have to accept women priests. So we have to accept um, abortion, all of these basic liberal um, cultural 
you know, what you would call the sexual revolution, that that whole agenda would have to be raised. So that's the more obvious version of it. The more subtle version is um, <clears throat> the embrace of, say, a broader sort of technical mindset. So there are those Christians who have embraced technique as their operative way of doing things. So in many ways, they're technocrats. And a lot of the, the leadership within the churches, you know, they've gone to university, they have degrees, they're professionals. Yeah. Uh, men, most of your pastors are professionals um, because they have their seminary degrees. And so they set about doing what they, I mean, many of these folks are sincere. They set about doing um, the work of the gospel, you know, sort of building churches, um, filling them up. But they do so in a manner that is technically oriented rather than necessarily spiritual. So they operate in sort of from a functionally materialist worldview while maintaining all of their God language. So a lot of these folks, um, because they're professionals, they see their natural peer group as other professionals, you know, doctors, lawyers, and, and the like. And so they want to seem, even though they want to remain Christians and be seen as devout Christians, they want to be seen as um, professionals like every other professional. And so they will do, they're, they're quite willing to bring in things like DEI, um, you know, so we need to be in favor of mass immigration. Um, there's a whole range of policy, even though they can affirm a conservative sexuality, um, they will sort of hedge at the lines. Well, we need to be compassionate. We need to be open. If somebody comes and says, you know, if somebody wants you, this was the whole thing recently, and I forget the pastor's name, put out a, a big spiel about, you know, somebody in my congregation came to me and asked, should they go to their their son or their daughter's gay wedding? Of course they should go because you don't want to alienate them from the gospel. These type of so you'll see that the folks appealing to the values of the professional class, the regime class, they use the same methods that the regime, so the same structures that are used and, and things that are used to run the administrative state, run Fortune 500 companies are also the same means that are being used to run churches and grow churches. So church growth movement, yeah. um, you're using systems, you're using uh, methodologies. Um, and so these many ways, they are technocrats for the gospel. And so what happens is, is that um, the regime and regime thinking has been brought into the church through a kind of professionalization of it. So we have to approach church like it's a business. We have to be, you know, all of these types of, of things that people will say. And as a result, gradually, and, and because technique is really the, the default ideology for progressive liberalism, you know, there's that whole thing that any organization, if left to its own devices, um, gradually liberalizes. And that's in part because of the use of of technique, policy manuals, um, technical administration techniques, and so forth. There's unless you are self-consciously conservative and fight actively fight that impulse. As soon as you take your foot off that active, you know, pushing against the other direction, you will naturally begin to drift leftward. Even if you don't go the whole way, even if you don't become a crazy left. So what a lot of these folks are looking for is they're looking to fit into sort of that what they would call the broad neutral space. So they often place a lot of stake in the idea of a public neutrality as their friend. So, you know, that's like you get into that whole controversy of the satanic altar in the Iowa state house, right? Well, we have to support that because if, if we don't support that Christianity could be under threat by the regime. So we have to support having, which is just, it's, it's mind boggling that you would see a Christian pastor say, we have to defend somebody's right to put a satanic altar in our state house. And you're just like, are you listening to yourself, right? But they're doing this in largely because they have this belief that a neutral public space protects them. And so, and the neutral public space is just a fiction anyways, but they have a belief in this formalism, the functionalism of the, the old center, even though it's dead religiously, um, you go through the, so you end up with like, um, drag queen story hour we have to support that we have to do all and so they will support all of these radical agenda items because they're they're framed and cast in a way that 
is um, meant to prey on and poke the buttons of you know, religious freedom, freedom of speech. And so they will say, well, we have to guard other people's rights to be different than us to protect our own Christian faith. And so they, 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 and this is that part of that professional mindset. And so they go in as professionals and they basically have more or less acquiesced to the lip, to, to, to the regime way of thinking, believing in many ways that in so doing, they're protecting their own ability to be Christian because the public space is neutral. So we have to support the, the, the formalism of the regime. So that way we can get, retain our rights for freedom of religion. But they don't realize that they've already basically become the regime in their use of technical administration to grow churches, in the professionalization of the clergy and all of these types of things, that they see themselves as basically being the same class as the the expert class that runs the administration. Mm -hmm. And so their churches become just basically another variation on an organization. It's an organization like a Fortune 500 company. It's an organization like um, a government bureaucracy. And the church becomes just another organization like that. But it's done so with um, a veneer of God language. Mm -hmm. now, I know I'm being quite harsh on my own, but that's kind of my assessment what, of it. What would be the alternative to that? Especially if you want to have uh, an organization of a certain level of complexity, which a church is, how would you well, scale that's the up one that thing, without is that becoming the tool? A technical tool. system is designed to scale things up. So you would then basically recognize that, well, maybe one of the things that we have to do is to scale back the size of our churches is one thing. But then you're looking to... Hmm. More or less two things is, is to build an organic culture in which you don't rely on systems, you don't rely on policies, that the ways of doing things are embedded in memory, embedded in the culture of the community, and they're passed on much like you would with an apprenticeship. They're passed on through a long process of intensive learning. So like maybe a boot camp. Um, uh, you know, fall camp for football, but also uh, overtones of, say, like learning a trade where you are taught the tools of this. So, um, and so you, you enculturate the faith in the people. And then at heart, I think it becomes more, rather than intellectualized and rationalized and technologized, you go back to the heart of being essentially, um, you you reinvigorate the the mystical tradition in that sense, and so the direct meeting of God. Um, what what character does that take? Is it a familial uh, organization structure, or it would be partly familial, but more or less it, it you're you're based on like a community of believers type thing. So it's it's you're in an intensive intentional community that is looking to in culturate people. This is a whole process of go and make disciples. Discipleship is really a process of, um, I would argue it's a process of intensive um, enculturation into the way. It's sort of, if you, if you watch the Gospels and you see what Jesus does with his disciples, a lot of what he's doing is teaching them how to have faith. He's teaching them how to do the things that he was doing. You know, the feeding of the 5,000, right? It's like, the disciples come, they approach him, they say, well, we have all these people, you should send them away, Lord, so they can go find something to eat. Jesus says, well, you feed them, right? And the disciples are like, we can't feed them, all we've got is a couple of loaves here, just enough for ourselves, basically. And so Jesus then, exasperated, says, here, and he prays over it, and um, God's power is at work, and he feeds the 5,000 with a few loaves and a few fishes. And so he teaches them how to do faith on a first hand, and then he says to them at the end, when he's about to depart, he says, now go and do likewise, uh, go and make disciples in my name. So in a sense, go do what I did with you, go do this with others, teach them how to believe, teach them how to have faith, um, teach them how to do things the way that I did. And that's really the intensive process. So the Christian community has always been intentional. Um, and it's always been a sense that we can full, you don't have to, you're not necessarily born into it. But at the same time, it's not necessarily what you might call voluntaristic, where you can kind of come and go as you please. Once you say, I'm going to commit to it, the idea is that you're, you're committing to an intensive process of, like the disciples went under with Jesus, of enculturation into the community to become a part of the community. Mm -hmm. you, you said Which is one of the things, by the way, which is one of the things that we don't do these days. 
like almost almost nowhere people just show up they come people just show up or yeah, we approach education through a technocratic approach like we're um you know teaching them the walmart way so we're you know we use technocratic means to um as we really teach but um how do you put it? We're training people rather than, you know, like we would in a workplace rather than actually discipling them. Okay. So they go to training sessions, yeah. technical training sessions. Well, if they um, get anything at all. Just putting aside the question if God's power, or Christ likeness, or Christ himself can or cannot work through these means, through this form, through this wineskin, uh, mm -hmm. if this wineskin can or cannot, you know, hold that little essence what is that little essence you said the power of god so what is that where is that how is that manifest or not manifest can you feel it when it's there can you feel it when it's not there do you do, do you receive well, it that's from, part of the learning process from i think discipleship just, or through yeah that's part of the discipleship process is is learning how to um now and everybody will in a sense that these are all variously also gifts as well too you talk about the gifts of the spirit right so mm. there are those who will be better able to do it by god's gift and those who will do it not quite as well but everybody to some degree or other will do it and it's it's like by doing it you mean receiving and giving that discipleship well, yeah but it's it's also kind of an it's partly intuitive um how familiar are you with mcgilchrist's the uh, master and his emissary fairly generally Somewhat. knowledgeable yeah or james is the bicameral mind and so forth so there is from a quote-unquote scientific perspective but if, if you're looking at it from a, a somewhat material perspective mcgilchrist's basic argument is that in the rationalism of the the technical age coming from modernity forward that one of the things that we have done is overemphasize the rational and the objective and so forth to the detriment of the intuitive and we might even dare say the mystical so we have been allowing that aspect of ourselves to grow dormant flaccid weak so in some sense hmm. we we as human beings are less capable today to meet god than someone prior to the enlightenment if that makes sense so this that is they were what you're talking about when you brought up the word mystical yeah in some sense meeting that sort of the di the the direct apprehensions of god so meeting god in that sense um you know theology as um you know theos and logos instead of talking about god which is the western tradition of rational theology you go more the orthodox talking to god or talking with god so prayer and worship become a become th our, our theology so prayer so when it says you want to do theology come with me and pray and i will show you theology hmm. and so that's the kind of process and so everybody will have varying abilities just like you have people with different varying athletic abilities but everyone if you start for, as a couch potato even if you have the potential to be an elite olympic athlete if you're out of shape you will not be able to run Right. So, you know, so there is this sense that like McGilchrist and so all of this side of ourselves, this intuitive side of ourselves that we've allowed to atrophy as we've embraced rationalism across society um, has to now be worked out again. So we have to start training ourselves. Or training. Mm -hmm. Part of it is, is this is one of the reasons why we're given the Gospels, I believe, is that you know, God in his providence knew that there would be times where people forgot how to do discipleship. And so you can open the book and you can go back and you can follow, you know, follow Jesus' example in that sense. And there's very clear promises in the scripture of, you know, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open to you. One of the promises, you know, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him? So there's the sense that the role of the Spirit of God is to reveal the heart of God, to, to make known um, who God is to us, to allow us to meet God in his heart. And so there's this sense of then in that intuitive sense of just doing the work of prayer, the work of worship, um, the work of reading the word, the work of service, um, to then um, 
get ourselves, our minds, our spirits back in the kind of shape where we can once again apprehend God according to the abilities that God has given us, if that makes sense. So that's, um, I think that's kind of where we're at, is we're yeah. a bunch of people who are, are spiritual couch potatoes in many ways, yeah. and we just can't run. Many of us can't walk without getting, you know, we need canes or whatever. And so we have yeah. to get up and, and, and become more, um, get ourselves back into shape at a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. One, so you're, you're dropping a lot of words that I think have lost meaning to most people. Many. Um, and, you know, I, I went to college later in life, uh, you know, in my mid 30s, and I did a kind of basically a literary degree. And we go, we go through old literature, and the kids just didn't get any of the references at all. They had no idea what it was founded on because they had never gone to church. They had never like studied no. the Bible and the Bible is like the cornerstone of so much English literature. So without that, then oh, yeah. you just, you, you're just basically uh, ignoramuses just on a study level, just on a, just on a, the rote level of understanding the references and stuff. But you bring up the concept of prayer and this is something that I speak with my wife about a lot. She, she wants to pray, but she doesn't know how to pray. Um, I, I don't know how to do that or for her or teach her to do it. I kind of just give, uh, give a kind of, um, hints about, uh, attitude or, uh, attention where you kind of put your attention into a state, you open, you relax, um, and you commune with that and you ask for guidance or a touch or, some sort well, of there are, circuit there. Yeah, there are, I mean, not to say that it's necessarily easy, but there are works out there that do talk about it. two, probably sort of rudimentary. One is to just, um, get any, I'm just going to go back to my library here for just a second. Okay. Uh, it's a well-read it's, man. I've got books everywhere. Um, you know, when I was growing up in the church for confirmation or for Bible study for youth group and stuff like that, the uh, pastor would, there was an acronym for prayer, like supplication, thanksgiving. I can't remember what the acronym was, but there was these different aspects of it. Or I, I, I can't just find it off the top of my mind. But um, the, the, the acronym you're looking for is ACTS. Yeah. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Acts, A-C-T-S. Mm -hmm. So you praise God, you confess, you give thanks, and then you ask, and then you suppl supplication. So that's your Acts formula. So that's very, I still use that in public prayer, to but be honest with you. I, I, um, have to, I have to say or bring up that that aesthetically sounds like a technocratic way of it does. dealing with things. So then there, there is also, um, there is the, the praying of the Lord's Prayer. Um, both just as it is in repetition, um, but also then expanding upon the, the various lines of the Lord's Prayer. Then there's the long tradition of the Jesus Prayer, which is, you know, that gets into more Eastern Orthodox. And um, I generally tend to use, so I have a, like you can see this now, I know you're going to probably, you're going to put the avatar out there, but for your sake, I have like a, an Orthodox prayer bead, which I made myself tie, learned how to tie the knots, learn how to think. But so what I will do is I will do re 10 repeats of the Jesus prayer. You breathe in Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, right? And then breathe out, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And so part of it is the breathing exercise. Part of it, and this goes back long before what you would call technique. This is just a lot. And then you do that for 10. And then when you hit the larger bead, you go into free prayer. And usually within the 10 beads of the first one where you're doing the Jesus prayer, something will come to mind. The Lord will prompt you. There will be something will come to mind. And then you can pray for that until it's done. And you go back. And by the time I'm done the loop, it's, you know, 100 of the Jesus prayers and 10 of the or 11 of the free prayers. Mm -hmm. And it, if you do the whole loop, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. How often right? do you just, do that? I try to do it daily, but it's usually it's wow. probably three to five times a week, depending. I have a busy schedule, unfortunately, which is one of the things that I have been mentally committing myself to just um, hmm. doing more in terms of prayer, just because, again, except with that wisdom tradition, is that when you do that, it cuts you off from all of the the 
yeah, it just cuts you off from good decision making, shall we say? Just mm. being near to God is yeah. sort of the root of of wisdom. And yeah. so when you're away from God, you're withdrawing yourself from the source of wisdom and even the source of your own personal authority in that sense, because it all flows out of God. So if you're going to have authority to speak and to talk and to write and to act, then to stand before the face of God gives you confidence that when you're making decisions, you're making the right ones. Mm. Mm. So you used a different term now. Is, what's the difference between the mystical tradition or the mystic tradition and the wisdom tradition? Is there a functional difference or is those interchangeable? Well, the mystical tradition probably is more rooted in, um, there's both a, like a, a Western and an Eastern, but it's more rooted in what you would call the spirituals, whereas the wisdom tradition goes back into scripture itself. So there's, um, you can call, you can talk about some texts being mystical or whatever, but there's not really this, the same idea of a mystical tradition um, in the scriptures. So the mystical tradition is built out of some of those teachings um, that are then people, you know, believing this is how it should be rightly a applied in action. But for the most part, the wisdom tradition goes back into some of the oldest texts in scripture. So in Job, in Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, and and some others that, um, and then carry forward into, especially the Gospel of John. You see it, but you see it throughout the um, the New Testament as well. Jesus as the wisdom of God embodied in a person. So that's where that idea "I am the truth" comes from. Is that sense of um, truth is not an abstract conceptual thing. Truth is a person. So what does that mean, right? Mm. So I am the truth. I am the way, the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, so that's that sense that that Jesus Himself is the embodiment of wisdom, right? The He is the divine logos in the flesh, the incarnation. And so, what does you that know, mean? You go back, like a, what's just, that right? Uh, it, it, it's just it's not IQ. What is wisdom? Um, is it? Uh... Okay, so just being wisdom, able to see a pattern of God's will and then lean into that and in something world. like that, but it's it's being able to to probably sight, being able to see correctly the situation, yeah, and then being able to see what to do in response to this, right? Yeah. So our age tends to focus very clearly on um, knowledge. So knowledge is power. Right? So we want it to be rational. We want to be able to um, to be practical. Um, we want it to uh, be efficient, um, useful. And so knowledge is power. Um, in the biblical, there's some overlap between the concepts because they didn't live in a technical age, right? But so we tend to generally rely on wisdom as power, you know, and knowledge and and knowledge is power. In the wisdom tradition, it's much more, um, you don't really have anything. So I, I may have used this example with hmm. you before, um, but I've used it quite frequently. So if any of my regular listeners are are listening, my apologies again. But Proverbs 24 or 26 verse 4 and 5 offers a very nice little combination of verses. So in the first verse, it says, um, do not correct a fool or you'll get sucked up into his folly, something like that. And then the next verse says, um, correct a fool or he will forever remain in his folly. So here you have two back-to-back -back pieces of advice, commands, whatever. And that seems very much, if you have this idea of like, you know, God's guide for my life sort of approach to reading scripture could leave you very flummoxed, right? Until you realize that really the bringing those two verses together and juxtaposing them right that right after is a commentary itself on the nature of wisdom itself. So the right answer is not found in either of the two, but in between, so to speak. So you live before God. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So in some sense, like Moses, like Abraham, um, you go up the mountain and you meet God. You stand face to face with God as best as you are able. And as you meet God and as you tremble before him, there is this sense of God allows you, opens you up, 
this this the fear of the Lord sort of posture, being before God, opens your eyes up to see things correctly. So then you come down the mountain, and having gained sight, um, you then say, "Meet the fool on the road." Now, in that moment, you will know what it is the right thing to do to either correct him or not correct him. Um, another really, really good example of this is, in contrast to our modern ways of doing things, is the story of Solomon and the, the two prostitutes. So both of them were mothers. One of them had her baby die in the middle of the night and switched her dead baby with the other girl's living baby. When they woke, the one said, hey, you've got my baby. And the other one says, no, this is my baby. So they brought their con their, their conflict to Solomon. And he said, um, well, I have a good solution for this. Let's cut the baby in half. And then you can each have half a baby. And then the, you know, it revealed the real mother wanted the baby to live. And so she said, well, she can have the baby, let the child live in that sense. And so you try to think from a policy manual perspective, mm. it's quite horrifying, right? To you know, cut the baby in half. Yeah, that's not um, in any but, protocol manual that I know of. No, so how do you write other than the, the gender affirming the clinics? Si but that's yeah, uh, the correct uh, situation to cut a baby in half. And we have, you know, we we flipped to you know page three thousand two hundred one. Looked under section twelve, <laughs> subsection C, points A through E will tell you um, the right circumstances under which it's 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 appropriate to recommend cutting a baby in half. And we both know that. That's ludicrous. And, and in that sense, what Solomon is doing sort of exposes the poverty of our policy manual directed. And wow. this is why we have an authority crisis today in, in things, you know, COVID, the COVID revealed um, is because we we no longer cultivate solomons in our midst and we no longer trust them because we see them as inherently authoritarian we don't trust authority invested in a single person now even if solomon represents sort of the highest archetype shall we say of of the wisdom tradition and this is why archetypal things are so important so you have somebody say the local leader in your church while well, he's not solomon but he evidences that the archetype of the wise man who walks before God. So now you know in your community, if you need advice on walking with God or what to do in this situation, should I date this woman? Should I take this job? Should I, you know what I mean? Um, mm. All of these types of normal questions that people have, you can go to um, your Solomon in your community and your own Solomon will then, as the archetype of the wise man, have the authority to speak into your situation and perform a judgment. This is really the essence, in that sense, of what, say, a body like the Supreme Court is supposed to do. Right? They're supposed to evidence the, the role of, of the Solomon-like figure who then interprets the will of the law or, or interprets the law in the moment and applies it into a situation where there's nothing pre-written ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and this also too, and this is one of these things we go to get loop back to Schmidt when he talks about, um, and this is why he calls his book political theology. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the, the moment of exception, right? So we can have all these rules. We can have this closed system of rationality, this closed system of, and we look at law like a policy manual. And Schmidt argues that there's always going to be a situation that breaks out that cannot be accounted for in the policy manual, like Solomon and the, and the two mothers. So what do you do, right? So the king, as someone who's vested with authority, right, is both the, the living embodiment of the authority of God in the community. So in one sense, he is under the law, right? Because he's under God's law, but yet there are these moments where the king is expected to pronounce law. He's outside of the law. So the king is this figure. So, and he occupies the role of the good king, again, another archetype, the good king. So the good king who is established by God and then who is subject to God and, and in a sense is accountable to God, so he's not accountable to the people necessarily. He's accountable to God for his actions, though. He is both under the law and in the moment of exception. He's got the two widows in front of him or the two, the two um, prostitutes in front of him with the baby. He can, in that moment, pronounce law that's outside of the system. So he can meet the exception and pronounce law. And what Schmidt argued is that by getting rid of the old monarchical system to embrace the, the liberal democratic system, he said, we severed ourselves from that. We believed that we could replace it with a technocratic, rational, that we could work out 
ourselves rationally what all the right laws are. And Schmidt argues that no, you cannot because it's not based on anything. Where see, the king is based on the authority of God that's been given to him. Hmm. So he pronounces it because God has put him in this position to then speak in the moment outside of law, where there's nobody really in our closed system of rationality to do it. And ultimately, Schmidt argues that once you severed that bond with it, all that's left is power. So what will happen is when the exception comes, the dictator emerges and he acts with power and his power becomes the authority by which he then remakes the system according to his own image. Okay. And that's... I need I need to open that up a little bit because uh, you say it's, I guess, rationalist, liberal democracy or find the right term. Mm -hmm. It's not based on anything. It's got to be based it's on something. Not. It's based on rationality, right? I mean, it's got to yes, be based, which isn't on something. based on. So, anything. what is it based on? Nothing. It's got to be based it, on something. It isn't though. It's based on on reason, and that's the. And this is what Alistair McIntyre argues is the is the fundamental flaw in the modern system, because Kant severed that. Um, that 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 connection with metaphysics, because you argue that well, you can't see that you can't see the forms, you can't see this. So we're going to sever that, and then we're going to build a new a new morality based on rationality. What they didn't appreciate was the fact all of these things that they, you know, you can see it written in the Constitution, right? These truths we hold self-evident. Well, they're only self-evident if your culture supports and tells you all this sort of what we talked about very early on in the church community, right? If your culture tells you that all these things are self-evident, well, of course they're self-evident. But once the culture, that, that religious connection dwindles in the culture and these things are no longer self-evident basically really all morality comes down to is how do i feel about something and this is what now alistair mcintyre argued is that you cannot establish a system of law based on pure rationality because it isn't grounded on anything it in some sense and now we, we find this crazy but you you need this sense either it's grounded on power right just human power or in this sense the postmoderns are correct or it's grounded in the metaphysical, either the direct theophany from God or that metaphysical sight that then, um, that the thing that the wise man goes up the mountain and sees. And, that's, and this is what, really what the, the, the philosophy Augusto del Noci called, he called it ontologism. And he argued sort of in a, you know, contra Kant, that within the Christian religious tradition, now he was a Catholic, Italian Catholic philosopher, Within the within the religious Christian religious tradition, that you know, as opposed to the Nietzschean and both the left and the right, liberalism and fascism, you know, these two basic post-Nietzschean God is dead realities, you know, we severed off the met metaphysical. He argued that there is un contra Kant real content in the metaphysical and in the supernatural. Right. And he says that is the path forward to avoid both mm. the dangers of fascism and the dangers of liberalism, capitalism, communism on the other side. So the utopia, he called it future utopianism versus past utopianism. And so Del Noche argues that in this hmm. um, ontologism, in this encounter with God, with the supernatural, there's real kind. And this is really, I think, what McGilchrist is trying to get at, this intuitive encounter. So we would look at it and say, well, it's non-rational, there's nothing rest of the and 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 Del Noche is arguing that no, even though it's intuitive, this intuitive knowledge is the ground of rationality. And that's basically what McGilchrist argues as well, too, is that we apprehend the world intuitively. And then within our brains, our brains then take the thing that we apprehend intuitively and it rationalizes. And if this is a balanced process, it's healthy. So in a sense, you should be able to say, I sense God acting here. And it has a rational content. I sense God at move here. And in our Western mind, a rational mind, we're like, what do you mean you can't say that? You know what I mean? But really what McGilchrist, what Del Noche all is saying is that we need to take this idea that I'm meeting God, I'm meeting the supernatural, I'm seeing things in the forms, given the fact that I have a sight that maybe other people don't because I'm you know, spiritually in shape. And, and, and now I'm able to see the archetypes, I'm able to see the forms, I'm able to see the work of God at hand. And I'm able to pronounce like the way that, you know, Schmidt's king is both within, without the law. I'm able to see intuitively that this is what God would want us to do in the moment. 
And part of the formalism of having the role of the king allows you to restrain that. So not everybody's doing it in society all at once, which would be total chaos. This is why, in a sense, you need the man of authority who's recognized. So where does he get his authority? Part of it comes from the office, but part of it also comes from the man himself commands authority by living into the formal reality that's there in the metaphysics. So he becomes the good king. So we often think like, well, we, we're, you know, we we have to remain true to ourselves, right? The important thing is I'm true to my own inner vice. Whereas the biblical and the older tradition is no, you need to conform yourself to the role you're given. And this is why it's important. Hmm. So you have been elevated to be king. Now you have to conform yourself to things. So in a sense, like Solomon, you go up the mountain, you ask God for wisdom, wisdom is granted, and now you can pronounce law for the people. So all of these old stories are very, very powerful and they're revealing, you know, fundamental realities that, that, in the Enlightenment, we just sort of cast aside because we were enamored with our own reason. And now we're paying the price for it. There is this sort of uh, term that's been floating around for some strange reason, and the term goes, Christ is king. Um, so it's kind of, oh. uh, yeah, right. So we can talk about why or what's <laughs> oh, what's going words. on there. <laughs> but, but, but. Christ but is it, king, by the way. If yeah. Christ is king, what is Christ telling us about kingship? Ah. So there we the go. The what is kingdom. What is Christ telling us of the content of kingship? So that's a good question. I'm not sure that we can entirely rationalize it, but there is a sense of um, that the content of kingship is realized in part through sacrifice, so you sacrifice yourself on behalf of the other, um, for the other, and part of kingship is also realized in having sacrificed yourself to be reborn again um, after the sacrifice. So there's this sense of you would think that, oh, you have to allow yourself to be defeated, right? So it's a kind of, you know, people sort of accuse Christianity, well, it's a weak faith because it's all about, you know, mm. being meek and I know it's about knowing and having the power to use the power directly to say that, no, the right thing is to lay myself down, lay my life down for the benefit of others, knowing that in so doing, you gain the power to... um overcome the death that you received and in overcoming the death you receive you are now in that sense master over all things it's the the realities are here as sort of metaphysics i mean people have been meditating on the death and resurrection of jesus christ for two millennia and i doubt that anyone has ever come close to to emptying out the content but this is again one of those things you're talking about prayer life that if you want to hold an image into your mind of because that, that's really the essence of the spiritual life is dying and rising both to yourself and to, uh, you know, is this this image of following Christ in death, but then also following him in death so that you might somehow attain the resurrection. I think the passage is in Philippians, right? So I, I wish that I could be like Christ in death so that I might somehow like him attain the resurrection. So the goal is always victory through resurrection and not just merely sacrifice for the sake of others. So Christ as king is a recognition that in his sacrifice, he holds the power of life and death in his hands and has gained victory over death. And now he is king and Lord over all creation. So, and it, it, a lot of times you just fall back to the standard language that's been worked out. And so I know it sounds trite sometimes and a little bit formulaic, um, but in many ways, you're also dealing with the deepest mysteries that you could probably spend a lifetime meditating on the meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ and the notion of the kingship of Christ and never exhaust the the well that it would always keep providing for you, if that yeah. makes sense. Related but different, but related. What is the... Um the dangers that you see presently with the politicization of Christianity in these terms, uh, in the, in the realm of politics, in the realm of discourse on, on you know, let's just use Twitter as just like kind of the chamber where it's yeah. Um, bad, bad. There's actors, a lot of dangers. Like I'm, I'm not a big there. fan of the label Christian nationalism only because I'm not a big fan of the idea of nationalism because 
Again, mm -hmm. once you understand technical realities and allowing it to scale society up, that in many ways, the nation is an unnatural thing that's imposed upon a large people group, that you really can't have a meaningful community at the level of a nation. So in some sense, you have to break down the community in order to build this thing called the nation. And in many ways, the nation is always artificial. But now that society has been somewhat broken down, we might say deracinated and massified and turned from small individual communities into a nation, people are now mad that somebody said like, oh, nation nationalism is bad. We need to globalize and get and, and destroy the nations. Now, people sort of fell in love with their nation after their communities were destroyed. And now people are mad at that. But it doesn't take away the fact that that the nation is a sense already has scaled society up beyond the point where it's really human. That society is really meant to live at the level of the village or maybe a handful of villages, you know, um, 500 people to maybe what, 2000 at max kind well, of thing. I mean, if you say that, then you go the WEF route and we're just going to depopulate the world back to some. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, some of that might be coming. I, I can, you can talk about the same. I mean, the world is what it is, right? So we have to recognize, but that is the same time recognizing that community is better than nation in terms of its humanity. Um, but nation is better than the, glo than the globalism in terms of, of its humanity. Um, I'm much more of the mind that, and, and here's kind of how I look at it, that um, there's two, there, there's a basically a number, we talked about the number of roles in society. So, you know, you have the role of the church, the priest, but you also have the role of the king. And I believe, you know, Romans 13, that these are God-given roles. So that we live in a sinful world, and in a sinful world, it requires um, the use of violence for certain reasons, one of them being the defense of your people against invaders. Um, again, you lay down your life for your, for your fellow man by defending them against the invader. The other is to punish the wicked doer or, or the, the wicked for and the evil doer for the benefit of the whole community. In a sense, the recognition that if some if, if you know if a criminal element is allowed to fester, they can destabilize the whole society. So for the good of the society, certain people just don't listen to and and can't be converted for whatever are just obstinate. And so in some ways you need to punish them and you need to punish them for the good of the community. Now God gives that gift of the of the sword, as we say, to the magistrate, and the magistrate is then responsible to God for thing. But putting that role of violence within the magistrate then is in theory supposed to contain it. So that way violence is contained within the magistrate. Now, we go back to the church. So the church, as we talked about, is built is an intentional community um, that we wanted to grow because we want everybody to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We want everybody to be enfolded into this community to be discipled. So if we're successful about that and the, the society be, and the community begins to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, eventually, in theory, you reach the point where you're a majority and you're the majority in society. You dominate the, the culture of your, of, of your larger uh, community, state, whatever. So at which point you face a question. You could say, well, the church isn't supposed to be political. But you think, well, really then, so basically you're asking us is like, we're 75% of the population. So because we can't be political, we have to allow ourselves to be ruled by the 25% who are the pagans. It just doesn't make sense. So at a certain point in time, the Christian community then be, has to become responsible. And, then, and this means working out a system of, of political governance. And what does that mean in a sinful world to do politics? Because now you're the majority in society. You're entrusted with the role of, of defense against the outsider, punishing the wrongdoer, of you know maintaining the secrets of the community. So all this stuff is fine. So you've got to lie. I mean, that's, the, you know, people say, well, you have to tell the truth. Well, no, in a, to maintain a society, you have to keep secrets. Right. That's what governments do. So there's all of these sort of demands that come on to you. Now, they come on to you in largely part because of a sinful world. That also means that you have to be you have to grab you have to use and wield power. Now, we know that power is corrupting. So for the good of the community, you put a handful of people, we would say, in spiritual danger because they're mm. they're embraced. They have they, they're being tasked by God to wield power. So they bear a responsibility to God for this. But it's inherently dangerous thing to do. Now, some people might not be capable, but in theory, you know, and, and, and to some extent, 
a lot of the choices you make in, as a political leader are not between what is right and wrong, but between a greater evil and a lesser evil. So no matter what your options are, you're doing evil. But you have to do it because you have to maintain the good of the community that this is the best thing I can do in a sinful world. And so I'm going to do evil, hmm. right? But I'm going to do it knowing that this is the best option I have. And this is really what the, the political leaders test it. Now, the role of the church, on the other hand, then, is to offer the pure call of the gospel. He can say to the political leader, hey, you've crossed a line here. I get what you need to do, but you've done what you need to do. But maybe it's time to come before the Lord and repent of what you've done in a certain way to, to recognize, you know, Lord, you tasked me with this thing to do, but it was the lesser of two evils, but it was still an evil. And then so the, the, the church in that sense becomes the, the prophetic call to call the leader to say, and but also then to minister grace to say that you can find forgiveness for this evil that you've, this necessary evil that you've done in society. So ideally, the two roles separate are meant to counterbalance each other and to sort of play off each other for the overall well-being of the society, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of how the medieval synthesis was understood. It, now, it, did it ever work out perfectly in practice? No, of course not. Right. But in a sense, there was this understanding that you had both of these entities, each with their own role, and they ideally were supposed to, to work hand in hand for the benefit of a godly society and to protect its well-being and to maintain order and harmony and blah, 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 and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my basic position. Now it's probably, it's an older, more classical, um, you know, medieval rooted kind of understanding of the relationship of, of church and state that way. Yeah. But if, uh, it's interesting that you said that you don't like the nation because I just got off that uh, listening to your Schmidtian uh, you know, analysis uh, of oh, the yeah. nation, where he said that nation is, uh, where he talks about the nation, talks about the the myth uh, that guides the power of myth and culture. Yeah, yes. As opposed to this parliamentary and rational, we're just going to be class based. Yeah, truth or or class. Yeah, I think that he is correct in that. Now. The, the question with Schmidt always in terms of mm. his Catholicism is, um, you know, to so these are the types of elements that in some ways were picked up by those of a more, um, shall we say, um, fascist bent. So, you know, you could approach that understanding of myth and mythos from a post-Nietzschean God is dead type of perspective. Like we talk about myth, but we don't really believe myth. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just all of the, 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 Hege the Hegelian spirit of the people, or you can recognize, I think, you know, more correctly is to understand that when you have a people group, there is something metaphysical that binds them together as a people. And that we're again, we're not individuals, right? So mm -hmm. there's something that binds us together at a metaphysical level. Um, so there's this idea that there's no private sins, shall we say? So what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom impacts you as another person. You can think of it even as a, hu a husband and wife relationship. If I'm in my bedroom watching porn, that definitely impacts our marriage, right? And if you can say it impacts our marriage, it impacts our kids. And if it impacts our kids, it's impacting the whole of society. And Christian teaching is very clear on this. There is no such thing as as a, a private thing that you do that you do in private that doesn't affect anybody else. That that sin you commit in private affects the whole community. Now, um, so th this idea then is based. You have this sort of spiritual community that that's bonded together as a people. And what Schmidt is saying, and this is how I would read him. Right, because you could read it in that more, you know, Nietzschean fascist kind of way. But I would read it more in a sense of of this real living presence that there's something in the people that binds them together, and that bond, that spiritual bond, is far more powerful than abstractions like class or nation. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why I believe, whether they do it intentionally or not, why the regime is constantly looking to break us down and deracinate us and massify us, to divide us, to individualize us. Because an individual, you cannot, a society that is based on the rights of the individual is an anti-society, 
It is not a, it's not a true, you know, if that's, if your political foundation is the individual, it's an anti-society. You're, 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 you don't have a society unless you have a community of a whole, a people that are bond together spiritually. And what Schmidt is arguing is it's that real bond that people share that is far more powerful than these abstractions. And that's one of the reasons why the, the, the regime wants to get rid of them. It's one of the reasons why they pressed where churches were attacked during COVID because churches have that spiritual bond. And so they resisted the propaganda of the regime Mm -hmm. um, to wear masks in many cases do like now many churches because of the professionalization of the churches buckled under and and so forth, but there was many who didn't and they found themselves under the, you know, the watchful gaze of Sauron that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things I believe that is happening say with mass immigration is this idea if you bring people in you then break down the bonds that people have already because you're breaking down the culture to have multicultural them which is really no culture at all so you're trying to actively break down the culture in part so that way people can be remade under the um the guy or under the, the the direction of the propagandist who will then fashion them according to the needs of the masses. Now we look back to things like, you know, the fifties as a golden era, but by the fifties already, people were already pretty much products of, of, you know, we talk about what is, what is it? Um, the, the mid century consensus, but the mid century's consensus was built on propaganda, you know, a unified three networks. Um, everybody goes to see the same movies. They watch the same TV shows. They watch the same evening news. They're buying all the same products. They have largely, their communities are already starting to break down. They just haven't felt the effects yet on the communities like we do two generations later, but they were largely already Hmm. a product of propaganda, that mid-century consensus. They don't have the same kind of, like if you look back to the 1850s, the kind of thick communities that were built there before that, communities are already starting to break down in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s during that mid-century consensus. So that idea that we have of, you know, the, the of the nation that's, that's, that I think there was already very much a product of propaganda. The much more real bonds that we have, I don't know if you ever saw that video of um, the MMA fighter who was asked his opinions on the Ukraine war or whatever, right? And he argues, he says, well, he says, I don't know what's going on in Russia or Ukraine or whatever, but he says, Listen, he says, it says, I have no desire to go over there and fight or whatever. But he says, if they bring the fight to me, he says, he says, I come from Arkansas. He says, I'm willing to die for me and mine in Arkansas. And that's the kind of thing that Schmidt is talking about there. That, and that's really when he talks about the, the, the concept of the political, he's talking about that dynamic where you have a conscious people group who are willing to die for each other. They don't even necessarily have to like all of each other, but they know that we are a people and then we will die for one another because we are a group of people. And that's really, the regime fears that. And they're looking to break that down all the time. And so, in yeah, and that's kind of where what? I think where Schmidt's coming from that way. Sorry, what's that? Meant? In order I to fashion that. what? In order to fashion people who are amenable to the technical regime. So you get up, you go to work five days a week, you go to your job at the, your your, your BS job in the office, you tap on the, on the thing and you vote, you know, you vote democratic um, and you support the, the system as it is because the system is largely inhuman and it's built on propaganda and you become a loyal, um, you know, a loyal member of society who's always in favor of the latest thing, who always defers to power, um, who always um, just basically does what they're told to do. They fit in, they do. And and so that's kind of, and it's largely in that sort of the, the you know, you mimetically just absorb and fashion yourself into sort of what the regime wants you to be. And, and that's, um, you know, we live in this sort of global technocratic society. And a lot of times it's like, we're like fish in water for the most part. Mm-hmm. Many of us don't even see how the degree to which our thoughts are not our own, hmm. even myself. Like I I've spent years studying this stuff and even I'm often astounded at, you know, the degree to which we have, I've been adapted to the technical world and the reality around it. I mean, look, we're talking over zoom with like yeah. mics and, you know, then the whole bit. Right. So we, even us, we've adapted to this sort of new reality. Yeah. So in the uh, places that you speak to, you know, with through your platform and then uh, on Twitter and stuff, you're very engaged with uh, a certain clade of people, like in a certain environment, 
dissident right, right wing stuff like that. Every once in a while, I mean, they're they're always churning, and it's just a roving yeah, yeah. band of people. There's no real substance to it or organization. There's no real political force. It's just kind of like a it's just a writer's den um, or den in some scum ways and villainy. Um, but is there <laughs> is there emergent order? Is there ideas such that you're promulgating other people? Kind of in your yeah, I think wheelhouse that are probably the, that are trickling out that are actually informing. Yes, I think so. I think that one of the growing movements that, um, in part, and this is why I'm also of the mind that um, meaningful opposition to the regime is going to come from the Christian community. So you have to understand how the the role that something like Twitter plays among. Um, the the news intelligentsia or whatever. So a lot of these folks in the regime who are part of sort of the news and the and the the idea making of the of the left regime, um, they all know each other. They go to the elite universities. They can be quite out in the open about their ideas because again, their their idea is acceptable. They they've conformed to power, and so they can talk openly. They can network openly. And Twitter is like. Um, jet fuel on that networking process, right? So it allows them to network faster and faster and faster and build power network and 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 resist attacks on power quicker. Okay. So now the right, there's a segment of the of the dissident right online that is really like a big discussion group. But because all of these people are coming from disparate places, they're nons, they don't know each other necessarily in real life, it's very, very hard for it to build something real. But the difference is with now that's not to say there isn't anything being built that's real. It's just very hard. Now, with the emergence of a new, robust Christian right, here you have a group of people that many of them, we do know each other. Okay. We do know. And sometimes, even though we are online as a nons, right, we have a whole network of people that, you know, once we sort of open up a little bit behind the scenes, it's like, oh, you know this guy, you know this guy, let me put you in touch with that guy. And so we haven't, we're used to building churches, we're used to building organizations, we're used to building communities. And many are saying, okay, listen, we probably can't bring down the regime. None of us are revolutionaries where we actually believe that sweeping aside the current order and instantiating something new is going to be a good thing, that the amount of suffering that that's going to bring about is probably not worth the cost. So um, what are we going to do then? Right. Well, so the real option then, and this is something that Jacques Ellul notes, is you build parallel communities. So you establish a parallel polity that's able to resist the rewards and the sanctions of the regime. You become like a porcupine to the regime's leopard or lion. Hmm. And so my daughter's handing back my truck keys. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and that I think is really, those types of movements are gaining steam. Now there's also those who, who want to engage in the political structures as they are. And so, you know, those are the more open, you know, Christian nationalist types who say, Hey, let's, let's, let's take over the system as it is and use it for our ends. I am because I, I read a little skeptical about the efficacy of that over the long term. But there, you know, the, the, I think that there's something real to that. So these folks have, they they represent a real kind of threat to the regime that the former online dissident right didn't, because there is a prior network of people that then Twitter allows them to communicate and gatekeep and do all of these functions much more quickly than they used to before. But it's all built on real networks of real people. That, I mean, Christianity, this is what, I mean, Spengler called us a ghetto community. Our nation is a people without a land, um, and we're rooted in our church communities, hmm. and we we represent um, a people. And I think there, as the mid-century consensus is breaking up, I think the regime is beginning to realize that all of these people are not necessarily aligned with us, and they represent a threat. And so you're seeing the regime turning itself more increasingly towards the threat of Christian on Christian nationalism. So they'll try to paint in it as negative a, a picture of it as possible. I think most people are not terribly wedded to the term one way or the other, but most people are sort of saying, hey, listen, um, we live here too. 
and we recommend we we rec uh, we represent a significant minority of the population, at least as big a minority as the hardcore progressive. And the hardcore progressive at 25 to 30% of the population, they run everything right now anyways. They don't need to be a majority. So Christians are saying, hey, if we're 30% of the population in the United States, why can't we do the same thing that the that the progressives are doing? And that's really the foundation of the of the culture war. And hmm. so both the the what I would say called the religious left and the religious right are looking to establish a new unitary society under, and that's really what the essence of the culture, there can be only one. You, you can't have a divided society. Either yeah. you split into two nations or multiple nations, or either the religion, like the progressive radical left defeats or, or basically makes the Christian right um, surrender, or the opposite happens. And that's, in a sense, how it gets resolved, this sort of the culture war. And it will keep intensifying until it does. Mm, okay. The political center is dead because it's just pure formalism. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a lot of power, money, and influence in that center and that it cannot... Formalism can go on like a zombie for a long time, especially because they have their levers in the power. But the real energy is coming from yeah. those two those two sides now. And the, that old center is caught in between. And this is what we were talking about earlier about you know the technical Christianity and so forth. Many Christians want to be in that center space because that's where they feel they have to be safe. So they're looking to sort of, people talk about putting away the woke, right? Well, you could equally talk about, you know, putting away the religious right and also the religious left. They're basically the same phenomenon. So we can get back to being our pure or our old formalistic society that, that we were comfortable with. Now, that ain't happening. That no? Both of the, these groups are on a collision course really? and either one will defeat the other or the two will divide into two. And that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, okay, I mean, so right now, too, the insta the left holds the institutional high ground and power, Yeah, um, well, but the, the right is growing. Nominally. I mean, if you, if you look at it, for whatever reason, the center or the regime has adopted the leftist uh, guys and way of dealing with things like the identitarian politics and, and uh, you know, the sexual liberation, that stuff, but couldn't it just equally adopt the Christian or return to a Christian morality? Uh, or is there something inherent in the mechanism of how the regime operates that makes it left, makes it amenable to leftists? Yeah, and that's that's largely the technical administration. So, um, so, so the technical administration is not a formalist neutral thing. No, it's not. Just, and that's, a, that's exactly forth. the thing. And that's what Schmidt argued is that we look at it like an empty vessel that's then filled with content. And yeah. Schmidt argued that, no, the system is inherently liberal. And the, the administrative state is inherently liberal. Does that mean it's inherently woke, inherently progressive, or just not liberal? Not necessarily. Just rationalistic, no. technocratic. It's just, it's, it's technocratic. And the technocratic is inherently progressive. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that... Now, there might be many in there who are, you know, comfortable with progressivism. I mean, many on the, the you know, Republicans and so forth are very comfortable with, you know, technical progress, economic progress. They just didn't like people, um, their lives being socially engineered, but they were quite comfortable with the notion of progress. So there really hasn't been, other than what you might call, say, a paleoconservative trend in in the U.S., there hasn't really technically been um, a conservative tradition. Now, the problem that many on the Christian right face is that many who consider themselves socially conservative, you know, in terms of, you know, sexual morality and so forth, um, have bought into the the liberal regime of of formal neutrality. So in many ways, they're liberals in disposition, um, but they're liberals who are, um, you know, culturally conservative in their sexual morals and family and so forth. And they don't, they, they, they don't see necessarily that the two are incompatible. Mm -hmm. And so there's a collision course coming within the Christian community and so there, you can see, I think, a sense where people, there will be a segment of Christianity that in, in the U.S. it's going to move towards support of the regime. And there's going to be 
a, a, a thing that's going to harden itself in, you know, radicalize itself in its opposition to the regime. And that means then um, they will walk away from their belief. There'll still be a sense of like, hey, we're American Christians and there's something different about us as American Christians that's uniquely American culturally. But there, I get the sense that eventually they're going to reject the, 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 the structures that were put in place um, in the founding and following. And something new will emerge. Such as? Um, any guesses? It's a good question. I don't know. And that's the sense of, of those of us who build parallel communities are saying, hey, we need to begin establishing a new bound and working on this. We can kind of sense it and lay it out. Now, it could be authoritarian. Like, you you know, Protestant Franco is a very much an option. Um, you know, you think of Nayib Bukele. Now, I'm skeptical that you can scale that up. Like, um, so and El Salvador is like six million people, right? So there's a sense that he has the benefit of scale working in his advantage. Um, that it's much easier to do in, 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 on that scale. I'm not convinced that you can necessarily scale what Bukele is doing up to the level of you know 350 million people. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, and also there's probably, an it's probably working of, because of, there's a culture. Uh, he's working with a certain right. demographic group. And, and I, I, I'm of the mind, I think, that you're going to end up seeing um, now, whether it happens in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, that, um, that eventually there's going to be a kind of breakup within the United States. I mean, the United States basically is an empire to begin with. The continental U.S. is itself an empire. It was, you know, United States is more or less, in my mind, like Europe, um, but it just has a much better track record of everybody working together. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing to say that that has to continue. So you could easily see it breaking up into, you know, 20, 30, much more manageable groups um, that are easier to administrate at a much smaller scale and easier to administrate culturally. But I could see it, you could see multiple different solutions coming up that way. So um, I would be, you know, ideally, I would love to see it grow from the ground up you know, rebuild culture, rebuild community. And then from within that mm -hmm. culture, um, men of character will emerge who are real genuine leaders who are then burdened by God to take those positions of authority to live into, um, for lack of a better word, the the role of the king or the magistrate or whatever, and, um, and rule. Um, so, and that's, you know, I mean, it, people look at it and think, oh, that's really retrograde. But up until the era of modernity, the 1700s or so, that was pretty much normal for all of humanity, for all of history, was a, a hierarchical structure to mm -hmm. to authority based on, you know, um, the will of God or the gods or, or so forth, right? There's a meme, I believe it's from that cartoon based in Texas. What's it called? Uh, okay, it's totally slipping my mind right now, but it's... Uh, Mike Judge production, guy who did Beavis and Butthead, made this long running King of the Hill. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this little meme where he goes up to this rock and roll guy. It's just a picture that's all I know of. And he says, you're not making Christianity better. You're making rock and roll worse. And it's about Christian rock. And I bring that up because the right has a problem. Well, it's got, there's just inherent cultural problems where it finds itself right now. What does it do with the open creatives and what does it do with women how does it sell itself to women when women have already been given freedom and power um uh, unmitigated by the the burdens the quote of, unquote the woman problem yeah the woman problem and then the creatives problem which is probably bundled together um what do you do Where, where's the right-wing media we can spit, spend all day bitching about disney which and make tons of money doing that and being nominally right-wing but you're not creating anything um so no, so where where where's this, the creative energy, and where's the you know the the woman service? Okay, so the 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 quote unquote woman problem is something that has been um, you know several hundred years in the making, <laughs> and largely goes back to. Are you familiar with a work, um, uh, the world that we lost, Peter Laslett? No, I haven't heard that. You should you should read. It's good. Okay. And he goes back to look at pre-industrial England mostly and in part pre-industrial America to a lesser degree and examines um, 
through historical record, a lot of the way that communities were organized and functioned. And he argues that the, the basic organizing unit for the bulk of society was what he called the household. And the household would be a farmhouse, it would be a shop, craftsmen, but the bulk of society are these people between the indigent poor and the gentry. And you have this sort of middle group that make up the most of society. And they are largely agrarian. Um, There's some craftsmen shops, all of these types of things, you know, so you'd have some, some, some shopkeepers, some, you know, the, the, um, you know, the furniture maker, the, the, um, the blacksmith, so forth, these types of, and the families were the these businesses these these groups were organized around the household so in a successful household you would have the husband and wife plus their own kids plus they would have farm hands they would have maids on hand and you would bring in people from other families now when you lived in that household you were under the authority of that that couple husband and wife so the father in that household let's say you move from your own house into this household to learn the trade of farming or or blacksmithing or whatever you were now under his authority and he could decide whether you were ready to be married or not married whether you were situated in life well enough not your own father hmm. but this is so you had this kind of political entity of the household and some were larger, some were smaller, some were more successful, some were others. But there were places in England, he said, about 30% of the communities in England had no gentry. They were just run by these households as a collective. Um, and so these households, now what happens with industrialization is industrialization destroys the household. Enclosure and the household destroys the, the and industrialize it, destroy the household. So within the household, there was a robust role for the woman managing the household affairs manage so there's this and it had education of the kids it had raising kids but there was it was well beyond so it was partly political because you were within like how do we make the community function so there was all of this rich world reward now once industrialization comes the woman comes out of that role she goes into the factory or whatever and now she has so then you have women's kind of jonesing around. Well, what do we do? Well, they have mm. the women's groups, women's society. They have the church groups and they begin to realize we can wield political power. So they want the vote. They want to go. I'm, Hey, I'm good at business. I want to have a role. I want to have a role. I think I want to go to university. So they begin advocating for all of these roles. They want the vote. They want to go to university. And then you discover lo and behold, this technical reality that men have built with indirect authority um, the policy manual, all of these types of things. And alongside of this, then the government at the same time steps in to fill the vacuum that was taken up by the or destroyed now in the household. So socialism sort of comes in to fill that void that the, the household used to fill in terms of social organization. So feeding the poor, feed, all these other roles that the household kept up in a local community are now then taken care of by the state. So how do you deal with the indigent poor? You don't deal with them as a collection of, of households in a village right? You deal with them now through a state agency. So then you have all of these, and they discovered with this indirect organization, um, you know, objective rules, objective standards, all the policy manual stuff, women discovered that they were really, really good at this because it's much more suited to a woman to use indirect power policy manuals than the direct hierarchy of a male-oriented society of kind of the one up or the one down. I best you in combat, I win, I move up, you lose, you lose down. And so society, when it's hierarchical, is built on that up-down of, mm. of direct confrontation mm -hmm. and then you know that establishing that pecking order. Now you have a society that is amenable to women more broadly. And as a result, um, then you... Um, you know, now you create this whole thing that women have power, political power, prestige in society, and you really can't undo this without undoing the whole of industrialization because you can't just tell them to go home and be housewives because there's nothing to them there other than just to be a nanny. Yeah. Right. Because you've taken it all away from them in, with industrialization. So the, 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 they've lost their role. So I get why women are annoyed, but at the same time, now you feminize the whole society. We have no elite and women don't really, you know, this, there's that old thing, you know, men drive society forward, women bind it together. But now you have a society in which, you know, that's the classic thing, like, um, you know, just, it's a caricature, right? Well, don't try to fix my problem. Just listen to me. Well, you expand that out on a society wide basis. 
right? Just listen to me. Don't try to. So you think like, okay, he's a homosexual, right? So rather than shunning him and putting him out to the side of the community, which, you know, as a, a thing, now, well, we accept him. We bind him together into the community. So then you would take all of this sort of what would normally be considered morally outside of the bounds of community, right? They would be shunned. They would be ostracized because, you know, so a man would say, well, that's just wrong. You can't behave like that way. You're just out, gone, right? Now, in a sense, well, we have to include them. We have to. So you allow all this dev deviant behavior in society because you have to be accepting. You can't say anything mean or all this kind of stuff, right? Even when women are conservative, they still don't like you to talk about, you know, um, like my wife. My wife is as conservative as they come. But if you say things directly, she'll still call me mean. And I'm like, you know, and it's, it's sort of... Um, <laughs> So, but, and that's kind of the problem that we have politically now is that you can't be mean to anybody. And so men are increasingly finding themselves emasculated because they're, they don't want to sit behind a desk and shovel paper. They want to be out, you know, building things, making things, farming, you know, they want to do things. They want to go to war. They want to build uh, chairs. They want to um, farm on the land. And all of these things have been taken from them. And they're told, well, you've got to shuffle paper and be an accountant, you know, and you're like, <sighs> you know. And so you gradually, um, and then you also take away a lot of the the, the markers for male, um, hmm. um, like rites of passage and so forth. Um, in many ways, men, because of the nature of like a man comes out of a woman, um, women generally just are. Like a woman kind of knows what a woman is because you're like your mother and you just are. Whereas a man is, well, I'm not like my mother, I'm different. So a man is in a sense defined by not being a woman. And so men need like all male groupings and they need rites of passage where other men tell you, okay, you've now passed out from underneath your mother's skirts and you are now part of one of us as a man. But women realize that there's real power in these male groups. So they broke them all down. So men have no place to go to be men because as soon as they do and gather to be men, women want to be there because they realize there's power in being all men. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can see sort of the problem that this creates for society down, you know, and, and so now we're in this position really where largely I, I'm of the mind that um, the women problem is not going to be solved, quote unquote, the women problem is not going to be solved without a major cataclysm in society. Mm -hmm. um, so something, some real shock to the system, economic or otherwise. Well, why, um, why is it framed as a woman problem? Well, because in a sense, I am of, now this is being very traditional conservative, of course, I'm of the mind that um, a rightly ordered society is naturally hierarchical. Um, again, rooted in the in sense of the divine hierarchy through the king down to society. And, um, and the, the, the nature, natural disposition for women is to be like a horizontal, everybody's the same in that regard. So for a healthy society is naturally hierarchical. Um, and so there, there's the problem and there, there is the problem of um, fertility. There's the problem of, um, you know, men not being men, um, a sort of listlessness. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole range of things. Yeah. Um, but it's, and there's a difference I think between women are very, very capable managers. Okay. But leadership, the kind of charisma, now there's, you know, I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule, but that kind of charismatic lead you into battle type of leadership is traditionally the domain of men and males, right? And so you, we have a society that is predispos predisposed to management, but we have no leaders. Mm -hmm. And so now there's still some around, but if we face a crisis, that will be a jar. And then, so my guess is that the, the quote unquote, the woman problem is not going to be resolved. Now, really, like a lot of it comes back to then would be reintegrating women in a healthy way into vibrant functioning households, right? Where they have a full range of meaningful roles from yeah. child rearing to probably the household finances to a political role that they play in their community. Um, but that largely means like deindustrialization and the kind of suffering that that deindustrialization would play at this point is, yeah. I don't think it's worth the cost right now. So you just, mm. it'll, it'll happen on its own. Right. But we aren't really, you know, I mean, well, we maybe almost the, at this point, maybe there's another way, maybe, maybe, maybe we're at a time in history, um, or in the development of technology that human beings can figure out a way to harmonize the sexes on a political level. 
harmonize those two tendencies? Allow Maybe, them to but I'm doubtful. No? Yeah, I'm doubtful. Not with, I think that, um, yeah, I, call me skeptical on that. And it's been, I... I'm at the point I'm looking okay. at the at the clock yeah. and I have to go soon yeah. to drop my daughter off at work. So wonderful. Um, yeah, now you you're good just father. as a thing, I know you're gonna probably do some editing at the intro or whatever. Um yeah. but um you're, you're going to cover here. everything up with Yeah, with yeah. The, you're you're yeah. anonymous, but uh uh why don't you tell us where we can find you and uh, Oh yeah, sure. What you're working on. There we on. go. Yeah. So thank you for having me on, Ben. Um you can find me on Twitter at underscore cryptos, and you can find me on Substack, um, seekingthehiddenthing.com, and that will get you right to my Substack. And there I have, I'm getting close to 75 articles now. It's like, wow, yeah. Um, I'm thinking of changing my bumper music when I get to 75 articles just to mark <laughs> the occasion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, um, so there's a lot of content, many recorded articles. So there's both audio, there's some podcasts that I've hosted with a, with a group chat that I'm in called the Christian ghetto. And we have, I think nine of those now. So it's, it's getting up there in context. So seeking the hidden thing.com and at underscore cryptos. And again, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for coming back. I mean, I have you back again when we, when we can find the time. Yeah, we'll have to do this again. Amazing. Sometime. It's great. So you have yeah. a good day. You too. Take care. All right. Ciao.